Welcome into the Gig'em 24-7 Sports Podcast. I am Andrew Hattersley. We've got three of us here today, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Brian, um, as always, joining us. And then Carter Carls, welcome to the welcome to the site, your first day on Gig'em 24-7. How's it gone so far? You know, it's gone well. I've already had uh, someone on the message board uh, ask for heat picks, so I um, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't be going better, I guess. <laughs> We're, we're off to a good start. And can you play linebackers? That's the most important question of the day is, is A&M needs a linebacker. Can you play linebacker? Uh, no. I'm more, I, more, I, of a, more of a cornerback in high school. I didn't like tackling at all. So, the, sorry. I, that's not me. That, I'm the opposite of that. I think the question was, can he coach linebackers? Oh, can he coach oh, linebackers? Even, even better. I mean, missing. Yeah. You need linebackers on the field and you need somebody to coach them up. <laughs> yes, I mean, right. running backs coach. They need they need several several coaches. That I mean, uh, spring ball's coming pretty yeah, soon to have uh, to be just missing two spots on staff. And you need a tight ends coach, or at least figure out what's going to happen with with that position as well, since that's who obviously Daryl Dickey was was in charge of. So they they need to figure out that position group as as well. And um, certainly got a lot to get to get Carter. Tell everybody just a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So um, for those that don't know, you know, I went to Texas A&M class of 2018 and, and covered uh, about three, maybe four. It all, it's all a blur now. Three seasons, I think, of, of Kevin Sumlin. And actually my last uh, job uh, while covering A&M was uh, Jimbo Fisher's introductory uh, press conference. So it's kind of like a, a – like that was like my last thing, and then now here I am back, and so much has happened since. It's kind of crazy to think, but um, since then I covered Notre Dame uh, football for three seasons uh, for the South Bend Tribune, and then uh, uh, went went down to Tallahassee to cover Florida State this past season. So you know every team I have covered uh, outside of school has had a ten win season at least. So. Maybe I am a good luck charm. Maybe people can expect a 10-plus win season. I don't know, but but we'll see if, if the luck continues. I'm, I'm dragging you down on that, so maybe our average can be <laughs> our average can be still still good, but no, it's not great. It seems the teams I cover don't do so well. Hey, at least poaching another person from, from uh, Florida State, right? That seems to be the trend that Texas A&M <laughs> likes, likes to kind of follow. I know there were, there were quite a few jokes on that front of people asking about, about NIL and buyout money and all that sort of stuff. Um, well, welcome. Glad, glad to have you. And you started off hitting the ground running, um, did a story on Bobby Petrino. Uh, what were some of your big takeaways from, from that story and getting to learn a little bit about him? Yeah, look, I mean, with Bobby Petrino, I, I think it's no secret that this is a very high-risk, high-reward uh, hire. It, it could really blow up and, and be bad for Jimbo Fisher, but it could also go really well. And I think everyone kind of understands why it wouldn't go well. So I kind of wanted to explore if, if it did go well, why would that be? And you just look through throughout his 40-year coaching career, and he's had success at almost every place he's been to. He's hit big at quarterback he has had explosive offenses with all kinds of different you know uh, players on the field uh, you know I talked about how Stefan LaFours and Brian Brom were two totally different quarterbacks that he had at Louisville and yet he was a top five you know scoring offense that he had with under both quarterbacks uh, back to back so just his ability to adapt to talent is something that he did to make a name for himself early on and, and, and later a little bit in his career. And the biggest thing is you look at this A&M roster and it's no doubt his most talented roster that he will ever coach. And, you know, I know he had Lamar Jackson and all that, but you just look at the numbers and uh, running the math, 247, what we launched in uh, 2010, right? I think I'm getting my knowledge uh, on 247 enough. Correct. But- yep. Since that year, 2010, he had only had two players on offense that were in the top 247 rankings. On AM's offense right now, there are 17 <laughs> players that were in the top 247. So it's not even close to, to what he has been accustomed to. 
he's had success at these former places. I think the questions are, you know, you know, what, what's going to be the dynamic between him and Jimbo Fisher? How much leeway is he, is he going to get with, with play calling? And then, you know, this kind of baggage that he brings, will that be a problem? You know, and, and so, so his intense coaching style too. Will that, will that rub players the wrong way? There are a lot of fair questions to ask. Um, is he someone that can continue to adapt? You know, he's, he's getting up there in age. He's, he's been around a long time. Can he continue? Uh, you talk to enough people and, and they have the confidence that he will. And yeah, I talked to a few interesting people for that story. So definitely check it out. Um, they kind of gave a deeper look at what his offense looks like. And, and like I said, how he's adapted throughout his career. But Adam, Brian, we obviously had some recruiting news on Monday evening with Anthony Maddox. Um, you joining the class as the fourth member of the 2024 class on the quarterback side. Obviously, the first the, him and uh, Jimbo Fisher and Bobby Petrino kind of zeroed in on Anthony Maddox over the past week. Things moved really quickly there. Uh, you got the chance to speak to Anthony Maddox. What what did he kind of say about Bobby Petrino and and kind of the way this all came together? Oh man, so you know Anthony Maddox, he committed on Monday. It was exactly a week after he had been offered. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he did not wait long to make that decision. Uh, you know, he said he had a final three of uh, A&M, Alabama, and Penn State. But when I was talking to him, he's like, man, he's like, I just had to put two other schools in there, you know, <laughs> to have a little bit of drama. You know, it really was just a final <laughs> one of A&M. He said that Petrino tried to get him to commit on the spot when uh, when he talked to him a week ago when he offered him. But he likes, uh, he likes A&M's offense a lot, and he likes what, he's, what he has seen at Petrino. Uh, he visited AM for the Florida game this year. Obviously, not a great, you know, offense for him to see, but he was able to see the facilities, the stadium, you know, the fans, things like that. And then just talking to Petrino about the future of the offense, he likes that they sold him on, you know, being the man in the class and, uh, you know, possibly getting the reins of the offense after uh, after Connor Wigman uh, graduates or goes to the NFL or whatever. Um, you know, so he likes that idea. You know, he knows Marcel Reed and, you know, he's, knows he's going to have to compete with Marcel Reed and whoever else is on campus. But, you know, he's just – he's real excited to be to be a part of this class. I mean, it's pretty obvious with him, you know, committing exactly a week later. And he actually – he told A&M coaches before he went public. So, I mean, it only took him a few days to commit. So, I mean, you got to you got to bet that he's – he likes what he sees so far. It's, it's going to be a fascinating dynamic now to – to watch over the the next couple of weeks and months how this all plays out because can't forget about before this week, Air Noland was kind of very, it seemed to be very much in the picture. He came off a basically a three day visit to A and M, um, not more than two weeks ago for the yeah. first junior day was one of the last guys off of campus on Sunday and so I I think the question for me is where he kind of fits into this. Does A and M look to take a two quarterback class um, and w- you know, is Air Nolan open to that? I think those are some of the questions that are certainly going to be be kind of the pressing ones moving forward. And, you know, a guy like Anthony Maddox, he comes from an NFL bloodline. Dad played in the NFL, has a younger brother in the 2025 class that, you know, having having Anthony in the class is certainly going to going to kind of help help in that regard. And um, going to be interesting to watch moving forward. But, you know, no doubt it's it's easy, it's better to get a quarterback in the class. Early on, A and M saw that last year. They spent basically the entire summer <laughs> and fall trying to find a quarterback. And, and I mean, kind they, of they did. A, they did have one at one point. You know, they, they did have one at one. One. It was so long ago that people forget forget he was. You know, he was a commit at one point. But yeah, yeah. First, really was, took a long time to get Marcel Reed. He was the first commit, I believe, in the twenty twenty. Yeah, he was even before class, Colton before, Thomas. So. Before Colton Thomason, yeah. and um, you know, took that took that trip to Alabama and ended up reopening his recruitment, but having a quarterback that's, that looks eager to, to get recruiting and get, get going, I think is, is certainly going to help. Um, we're going to switch gears and talk a little more about the team front and, and play a little buy or sell when, when we come back from a quick break.
Welcome back into the Gigum 24-7 Sports Podcast. I'm Andrew Hattersley, joined by Carter and Brian. Going to play a little by sell. We didn't do this last week as we kind of reacted to the Anaya Smith news of his return to, to A&M for another season. As I was looking through the stats on, on the past couple of years, you know, especially in the passing game, and not since 2016 has A&M had two receivers have more than 700 yards receiving in a season. Um, is this the year they kind of break that with, obviously they, they, there's three obvious targets with Evan Stewart, Moose Muhammad and, and then I Smith Carter, I'll start with you. What, what, do you, what do you kind of think about that? I'm buying it. Uh, I just, right. That's what we're doing. Right. Buy sell. Yeah. So yeah. Yes, yes. I think you got three receivers that you absolutely love here. I mean, I think Evan Stewart is a clear candidate to get a thousand yards. Um, I, I think that's very possible for him. And then Moose Muhammad and Ian Smith, both of those guys are capable. So, you know, maybe maybe because you have so many weapons, the wealth is shared a little too much to where maybe you got a bunch of guys that are at like 600 yards or something like that. But I think one of those guys will break through, and I have enough confidence in Connor Wegman that they'll be able to get to that mark. Brian, where do you – Oh, you yeah, I'm, I'm on board with Carter here. Uh, you know, I think Evan Stewart's probably a no-brainer to make it. Yeah. And then what? What do we have? I'm I'm here now. Moose Muhammad didn't even, you know, really what he had 610 yards this past year. Man, and they were only Evan Stewart was 51 yards from that. Moose was only 90 yards from that this past season. He only had, you know, uh, you know, he had an abbreviated season because Anias was that guy to start. Yeah. Um, you know, so he really took over after Anias got hurt, and then Evan Stewart missed a couple games. So yeah, I think I actually think that'll be. That'll be pretty easy, and I do think Evan Stewart probably gets a thousand yards. I think Wigman will really, you know, really have him. I think they'll be in a rhythm now that they've had a season, and then they'll have an off season together. So, yeah, you know, even shoot, even with this year's offense, I think it still would have would have been that. So, I, I buy it. Yeah, for me, the thing was splitting around receptions and splitting around yards, but I think you could see them look to get Anaya Smith in the backfield a little bit and kind of use him in some some different roles. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to buy that as well. I kind of, I kind of expect maybe there'd be a little bit of split opinions on that one. Carter, I know you, you got one too, right? Or the 1,000 yard rusher, if there will be one. I don't know. So, so we, we did, we did that at one point, but I mean, now with a different offense, I still say no, just because. Yeah. I mean, I think a is going to have to split carries. Uh, you know, they don't have. It's the first time in a long time they don't have at least somebody with experience coming back because. Even under Isaiah Spiller, you know, A-Chain got, uh, or A-Chain got uh, plenty of carries, and then uh, Spiller got him under Travion Williams. So it's the first time, really, there's not much. And I think it's, you know, Ruben Owens is going to get his carries, Le'Veon Moss, Amari Daniels. So I just don't see that happening. Yeah, for me, I, I, I'm kind of, kind of stick with what I, what I said before. I do think you'll see a guy kind of. Break out! I think an I think Amari Daniels could be that guy. As I mean, we saw kind of flashes late in the season um, that left me kind of intrigued. What he can do with with a full season of of carries, I do think Ruben Owens is going to factor into that backfield as well. But I think you'll still have I think you'll still have one guy kind of emerge, just because I I feel like that's been kind of the history that that Jimbo Fisher and and the staff have kind of gone with is they've gone with kind of that one that one back kind of leading the way. And it's going to be interesting to see kind of what the running back rotation is and, you know, whoever the running backs coach that comes in, what, how he kind of rotates backs. That's kind of a new wrinkle to this, this question as well is I think the last time we did this was, was when Tommy Robinson was the running backs coach and we kind of knew what his tendencies were and and what he wanted to do. So that's going to be, that's going to be another uh, new wrinkle as well. And then I got it. I got another one. Well, hold on. I want. I want to know what. I want to know Carter's thoughts on that. You yeah. Know? Are you gonna? Are you gonna disagree with us? I, I'm selling, and, and you know, I I do agree with Andrew in the sense. I mean, just think about the last two star running backs for for A and M, uh, Isaiah Spiller and and Devon A Chain. It, it felt like their freshman year, they could have been used a little bit more. I mean, I remember watching Spiller and thinking, I think this guy's a little bit better than Corbin. And, it, and they kind of yeah. later on figured that out. And yeah. Ashain, I mean, what, what he's able to do, you saw it in the North Carolina game, uh, that, that bowl game his freshman year where he really broke out. You're like, 
hmm, probably could have used him earlier on <laughs> in the season. Yeah. I don't know. So, you know, will that happen to a guy like Ruben Owens this year? I don't know, but I do think him enrolling early will help maybe speed up the, the process for him to see the field. And I think they'll divide it just enough where I don't know if there's a guy who's just like submitted as the, oh my gosh, this guy's so much better than everybody else. Yeah. And I think they could find that, but it may not happen till like game eight, game nine kind of thing. Yeah, the Devon Ache one was kind of puzzling because even in some of those earlier games, when you kind of looked at it, Isaiah Spiller was banged up too, and you were still kind of waiting, like, okay, are we going to see somebody step forward and, and kind of split those carries? And and it didn't happen in, until later in the year. And even this past year, I thought there might be a chance that you would see more of Amari Daniels or maybe Le'Veon Moss or kind of that second back emerge, and, and it didn't – didn't really happen so it's going to be it's going to be kind of interesting there's so much that's kind of unknown i think in some question marks that how they're going to kind of fit in and and what they're going to do um we got a got another one on uh, you know as we kind of get towards march here guys are we buying or selling is texas a&m a, a tournament team right now with the with a month to go in the year as as the certified basketball expert in this yep. conversation, I'd like I'd like to go first. Um, I just I just I read I actually read Jerry Palm's bracketology today, and I was I was like, where's A and M on this list? And then he's got like next or whatever, like the top teams. Like A and M's. I was like, how far did I have to scroll down? They were in the same group as Mississippi State. And okay, I don't know anything about college basketball, but that seems ridiculous because. A&M's got some uh, good wins, a second in the SEC. If they beat Auburn tonight, that'll be two uh, two big wins over the Tigers, including one on the road. So, yeah, they got to be in there. Like, it's ridiculous. I mean, the SEC, the SEC is top-loaded with, what, two good teams, Alabama and Tennessee, and nobody else even yeah. ranked. But, but I mean, a and I mean, it still takes talent and shows, you know, I know the non-conference wasn't good, but it still shows, you know, that they're good if you can finish that well in conference. So, i got to think they're in. Carter, what, what say you to that one? I'm buying, and, and I think they're right on the edge right now. I saw their first team out on Bracketology for Lenardi this morning. So they're they're like right there. And you look at their remaining schedule, and they have a lot of opportunities. I think they got eight games left in the regular season, and six of those games could be quad ones. The weird thing about tonight's game is Auburn is one spot away from being a quad one. And then if AM wins, it'll knock them even farther, oh, yeah. which is yeah. kind of funny. And and if they lose, it'll it'll move them up. So it doesn't And then you get a quad one loss, so it's all yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. So but I think Auburn will eventually return to quad one level just because like they've just they're kind of in a rough stretch. And I think maybe once they get a couple easier games, they can kind of climb their way back. But I think AM will end up having enough wins. They just can't fool around here down the stretch. They got to beat Ole Miss. Um, I think it helps too that Mississippi State, very winnable game, will be a quad one, you know, opportunity for them. Missouri, a team they beat by 18, is a quad one opportunity for them. Um, so that I think they've just got enough opportunities where if they just win, you know, two of these big games, take care of Ole Miss, maybe three of the big games, take care of Ole Miss, I think you're good to go. Yeah, I think they they left themselves. I'm going to buy them as a as a tournament team as well, just because I think this team that's playing right now is so much different as well from the team that uh, you know lost to Wofford and lost to Murray State and lost to Colorado in November and December. They're just a completely different team. And let's give them a pass as well. I know people want to bring up Arkansas last week. Keep in mind they had to fly to like. Oh, all yeah. over the place just to get in for the game. They had to drop, they had to bus two hours to, to get over to the arena and, and bus in late at night. So, you know, not the best performance in that game and a tough place to win to begin with. So, you know, at eight and two, I think they're off to a good start, but I I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. They've got opportunities when they go to Mississippi, when they go to Missouri, that's an opportunity when they, when they go uh, to Mississippi State, that's an opportunity. And you do have games against Alabama and Tennessee that are going to be tough games. But if you won one of them, you I think you put yourself in a really good spot. And I know A&M's goal coming into the year after what happened last year with you know the, the SEC tournament getting completely disregarded. I know they want to kind of feel good about their spot by the time the SEC tournament starts. And I think they've mm-hmm. got those opportunities. They've 
they've just got to be able to win. They can't lose the game at Ole Miss and got to be able to win their games at home. If they can do that with the way these crowds have been coming out, I think, I think they'll be in a good spot. Yeah. I look at where they're at in the SEC standing. They're, you know, they're tied for second. And I just wonder, you know, a top four team in the SEC, when's the last time a top four team did not make the tournament? It's just, it's hard to believe yeah. even if they lose to Bama, even if they lose to Tennessee by 50, it's like, okay, but, they're a top four team in the SEC. Yeah. How do you leave that team out? Right. Ne- I don't know if that's ever happened before. And, you that know, was- I just don't know what some of these people expect. It's like you got to win like 15 SEC games just to get in just because you lost yeah. to Wofford. Like, I-, I mean, you could pick-, pick holes through anybody's resume. So it's just kind of uh, – it-, it baffles me sometimes. That was kind of where I was looking at the top 25 rankings yesterday. And AM didn't even receive a vote in the top 25 and I know people kind of brought up the the Wofford loss and some of the the Murray State and Colorado losses and yeah okay but they're still eight and two in the SEC um they've beaten some good really good teams and you go look at some of those those teams that are on the bottom of the top 25 I think it was Rutgers has already lost to Temple Temple's a double digit lost team as well so you know everybody's kind of got their bad losses and they and they're glaring holes and you know I think this A&M the saying m squad's probably better than they're being given credit for, but they just got to take care of business and, um, you know, especially at home. And I, and I think they'll be all right in the long front. They just didn't give themselves any, any margin for, for error, but that's going to go ahead and wrap it up for, for today. Again, Carter, another big welcome to the site and, and look forward. I think everybody's going to really enjoy your content and, and everything coming. You came out of the gate swinging with a Bobby Petrino story. So, um, I know people really enjoyed that. Um, for those listening to us on, on YouTube, uh, be sure to give us a five-star review and, and like and share this, this video. If you listen on Apple, iTunes, and, and Spotify, be sure to give us a five-star review on there as well. And, and we'll be back next week to, to talk a little more basketball, talk, talk a little more recruiting, and talk a little more football. Take care, everybody.